this is requiring all specialist groups of which we're on to change our year as well in, in my view. And rather than just do a tweak as it were to our constitution, I looked at the constitution which is 10 years old, I realized it was somewhat out of date. So I said about rewriting it. And I hope to see it uh, here today to approve it, I hope. Um, <coughs> Let me just highlight one or two things of principle which are new and in there. I'm not going to go through it clause by clause, but of course I'm, I'm very, very happy to answer questions. First of all, um, it says more explicitly that the CCS and its members will abide by the code of practice of the BCS. The BCS is a charity uh, and all that, and we're part of it, and so we must behave professionally as a whole. The BCS must. This is a substitution for what they tried to do. Uh, and indeed, they have passed a gun in the BCS. And they've, they've, the BCS has said that all members of all specialist groups must be members of the BCS. I, when I first heard this, I said, rubbish. We have 800 members of the CCS, many of whom are retired. And I said, I cannot go to all those people and say, either you join the BCS or you're out. And being out, you can come as guests to our meetings only half of the year, is what they said. So I made representations at the very top, to President Albans, and essentially we got special dispensation. So, we really accept it. so the rule about we have to be members of the PCS does not apply to the CCS. But you're encouraged to be members of the PCS, and encouraged to be professional, and very much like you join. It's not mandatory. And so that was another reason to make sure the Constitution made it quite clear. For example, the chairman, the secretary, and the treasurer must be corporate members of the CCS in the constitution sense. Because they are, so I mean, they have a, a formal obligation to follow the charge of objectives, the professional objectives of the CCS, which is absolutely right. And so we make sure we all go. Mm. We're down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's been written in. We're a bit more specific in the agenda about, in the constitution about finances, about reimbursement expenses than it was before. We've actually made provision for the Northwest Group to exist. <laughs> because the, the, the Constitution 10 years ago didn't mention the Northwest at all. I know they existed, but they weren't mentioned at all, but they are now. Um, and uh, um, and the committee, the committee of the, BC, of the CCS has always been a large body. Like every leader of every project is automatically member. So the place is quite big. And when I first took over as chair, I thought, well, well, I can't cope with that. <laughs> it must have a small group. But actually, I've realized the value of that. And that's been perpetuated. So the committee of the CTS. I've tweaked it a bit because I think it's important that those who sit on the committee essentially have a job to do. Um, not just people who've been on for a long time. You, uh, people are too embarrassed to say, well, you know, your time's up. Um, and so we've made it that all members of the committee are appointed by the committee and then approved by the next AGM. Um, this is a practical way to do things. And so when this constitution has been approved, the committee will then look at the committee itself and check through and see whether any changes should be made. So essentially that's it. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions. Then I shall form put into a vote. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, can you just clarify for the benefit of other people, because I've already heard the answer. The relationship between the Code and Cyprus Heritage people, the Museum of Computing, actually, and the Electric Park Charitable Trust as yeah, well. Because, well, because there's going to be a member on the committee from... Yeah, from there the there are two slots on the committee, one for this Code and Cyprus Trust, and one representing the Electric Park Trust. Um, the reason why it doesn't say the National Museum of Computing is because the National Museum of Computing's title is not fully approved. They're not an accredited museum. It's sort of a working title. And this, of course, is a formal document. And it was considered important to, to put in a, a formal body. This trust is a trust under which the National Museum of Computing works. Um, I have to admit that the need to do that was pointed out to us that the two other museums who are formally in there, the Science Museum and the National and they say, boy, you know, that title of National Museum is not really yet approved by the museum world. And they didn't need to see that name there until it might be. So we, we, we quickly agreed to put in the body that did exist for 
I guess he means someone from national security. Okay, you need? Any other questions? So I, can, I assume, therefore, that it has your view. Yes. 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 No one dissenting. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> um, before I get on to the, well, it's 20 minutes, but I, don't, I, I suspect we might want to make a start. So I mean, or, or, do you think yeah. other people turn up? And, right, I, I, go, I would like to say that I'm aware of how much work the committee's put into actually ensuring that uh, the revisions were what we needed. Yeah. I think there should be a thank you yeah. to you for the work you put in. I want to just mention something of personal nature. Uh, some of you know that uh, Hamish Van Michael had a bereavement. His wife died last week, I think, a few weeks today. That's why he's not with us. Um, the instruction, as it were, is for those who want to pay a tribute to, uh, for donations to cancer research, and Alan Thompson is collecting and will collect any. Anyone feels good, and you hang particularly well. Uh, and he will put it through, and he will save the tax on it at the same time. Mm -hmm. but, but only Alan can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> but it's rather sad somehow that today is a day of the Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of saying, do we wait to see if he turns up? Uh, uh, no, I don't mind in the least. We'll get it underway. I know Dan eventually wants to get away. It shouldn't run this long, but. Shall we take the risk? Roger Johnson actually gave me a length of time. I will try and trim it down accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you better start with Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <Let's> start, <okay. laughs> Can I introduce today's speaker, um, Rob Brown? I met Rob first of all in Deepest Kent. And I never knew there was a place called Deepest Kent. I mean, I used to know it was a place where they grew hops. And then more recently, it was a place one dashed through on the way to France. Um, but there is Deepest Kent. And inside in Deepest Kent is a farm owned by Roger Holmes over there, uh, who was a, 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 of the Darling Buds of May fame because he had rents it out to film companies and put up to old cars. And he has a barn on this farm. In it, it's got something in it that Watson tells us about. Indeed, my survey. Good afternoon, and welcome to a presentation on the RCT 39 series at the Community Cultivation Society. Uh, it must be nearly 10 years since I've done a proper stand-up, and I used to have a little rule when I did it to engineers and customers. Uh, please feel free to fall asleep, but if you snore, I'll have to buy the beers afterwards. That tends to keep most people focused. Um, today, we would like to take you through uh, 47 years since a particular 1301 computer was delivered, and I've been asked by Roger Johnson to make it a time scale. I will trigger it accordingly. And part one really covers the precursor to the team that designed it, the design team themselves called CBA, and then what information that the 1300 project has gleaned from the GEC factory because people still remember making it. We've got a short video of that. Uh, part two is the working life and the range expansion, and possibly the start of some threads. There are three threads that run through the story. One is the life of a particular machine, one is the life of the Australian, and the other one is a strange association with temporary buildings that you want to come to life. Um, we have a small piece of video which we can slide in or out depending on time scales and whether or not you're all snoring. And part three really covers the range retirement, my retirement, and the launch of the resurrection project. Uh, we were adopted by the CCS February of this year, so this is a chance for me to tell you all about it. Uh, I won't tell you who's involved with that closed video, but uh, it's nice to see a face back up there that's very, very important to the design. So off we go. We need to set our time machines back to 51 years ago. Uh, and this is slightly before the normal um, time scales tell us things happen because that puts it about 58. Um, so, okay. Um, basically, they were beginning to believe that a uh, punch card equipment would never last forever. Obviously, computers had been quite successful prior to that, but the two companies, the British Tabulating Machine Company and Power Samus, got together and had a very, very disproportionate collection of punch card data kit. They needed to protect that business, and they only really had basic machines, basic calculating machines, and the 1200 range of computers to cover it. Um, 
um, as he says there, the pedigree of the 1200, I hope I've got this right, was the HEC4, which is very well known to us, and that new design is based in part on HEC1, and right back to the original ABEX valve machines. So it was time to actually say, what have we got as equipment, and what has got come down the track? So BTM plus Palisades, and they actually get together. They actually get together in January 59, so that takes us 50 years, and that sees the merger of the two companies, but we have this massive collection of very, very disproportionate equipment, which all does something, but you need all of these different machines to do things. And the real target is to find a box that does it all. Uh, I didn't realise, until somebody said, kindly sent me this logo, uh, that uh, BTM was so proud of their name, they never put it on the label. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, yes, uh, the equipment was referred to Horry's kit, and quite right, that was the roots of it. Um, but it was a large, large range of equipment, and I do have to go back to the slide, just to gel in your minds what we're talking about, the target design meeting. So we're talking about machines such as card sorters, punch card copying kit, which could not only duplicate cards, but could copy data from field to field, but it's still comment oriented Collators for merging data packs, this under logical uh, conditions would insert cards, remove cards, and basically you were meant to end up with a data pack that was ready to run in a tabulator, which did nothing more than list the cards, and you were really, really unlucky, it extracted a total that was somewhere near what the total should have been. <laughs> Hello there, Roger. <laughs> Do come in, sir. Um, we, we've actually kicked off a little early. Do we have any more? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, precisely, uh, precisely. Um, I, I, I we, took we, we took a chance. We took a chance. You haven't missed much, but I will hold until we make sure there's everybody in the room. Well, I was wondering if I could go back all the way, but I'll be honest with you. I think I need to go back to a. Sometimes get it wrong. Uh, just for you, sir, we're only one slide in and we've backed up. And uh, it's welcome to all the new faces that have arrived. And uh, basically, we have a presentation today on 47 years in the life of machine, which is, I will admit, not a star machine, but a machine in the life and uh, the legacy, if you like, that uh, we have early computing days. Uh, I'm just popping back to here because I need to check that I did get my lineage right and I didn't get a chance to check it out with Roger Johnson. Um, the 1200 was indeed the HEC4, which in turn was the HEC1, which I believe actually goes all the way back to Apex C. Absolutely correct, Rob. That's hey. young. <gasps> Fine. <laughs> um, I was trying to focus on the fact that it was an elderly design, really, uh, but quite a design as far as I'm concerned. My very first computer. Um, so let's scoot forward a little bit. Um, but really, the point starting here is that there is a lot of punch card etiquette that has to be secured. If you don't actually provide what's coming down the track, you will lose the punch card data equipment. So the British Tabulator Machine Power SAMUS basically merged in '59. There was a, a disproportionate quantity of equipment which was totally mismatched. But when you looked across the range of the equipment, there were various basic functions that this equipment did. That is just a logo that somebody kindly sent me when I pulled out the peel. Uh, and I did realise that uh, BTM was so proud of it that they didn't even put their own logo on. They decided they were going to be called Horace, which I would probably call it anyway. <laughs> uh, but what were those machines? What were the functions these machines did, which ultimately you wanted the new machine to do in the house? And it was salty. Reproduction and data field copying, actually collation of data, and finally, if you were lucky, a correct total after the listing. <laughs> but I do stress it wasn't always the case. 
If you want to get anything more complicated, there were machines at the time which were Monte Carlo oriented, which actually did multiplication. And it wasn't just limited to multiplication. I've actually seen one of our customers who actually used this for calculating odds. You know, it was one of the betting companies. And they knew how to plug that plug ball. I was quite impressed. Um, the other one, before I move on, is yes, the tabulator was capable of multiplying, but uh, not in real time. <laughs> so, we have some calculator pictures because when the new design is required, we're really looking for something that picks up where the calculators and multipliers finished, and something that actually incorporated the rest of the scheme. And the two machines identified by the team were the 500 calculator series because they were in hexadecimal. They basically had a decimal interface for the operator. Instead of having to learn binary, they were very usable. Power Sams have produced a PCC calculator, but I can't find any trace of it in the final design. And of course, BTM have produced 1200 range of valve computers, which were successfully handled in card files. Sorry about this picture, but it's the only picture I can find which actually shows the triple five with the drum. Um, a rare animal indeed, but let's talk about a little bit of the background of the triple five. It was valve based logic elements. From a servicing point of view, those elements you can see from the plug at the top did actually plug in and out and provided you remember to turn the power off so that you could get a nasty shock and allowed it to cool down, you could actually service this machine by a little replacement. Uh, data input and output was by an 80 column hollow with punch, and I can confirm to most people who know that nice piece of kit under the covers, yes, it did have the original cast iron Queen Anne legs. <laughs> it was really good really modern. Uh, programming was by plug board, um, limited but capable, I would say. Um, and now I'll intro you to my, my very first computer. I was not a computer engineer, I was a peripheral engineer, but I do know the tour well well. Uh, and if I got the facts right, clock speed of about 38.4, but a single serial bit of string. Storage was about to play on the drum. And if I remember right, it was a three address format, one drum address, something like a local register, which gave this jargon of immediate access stores. And the final one, which really made me step back when I realised how the poor old piece was working, the last address was the next instruction on the drum. Now this put a horrendous load on the program. Um, due to the rotary serial nature of the drum, if you got it wrong, you actually incurred an 18.75 millisecond delay per instruction. So, Program this machine, you were not only programming in machine code, you were planning where the code was, you were planning where the jump was, and now imagine a jump that goes in two different directions. Both paths have got to be fast. Techniques were very, very hard to produce. It was card input printing, that was done from a modified bitium ceiling tabulator, and card output was to an 80 column card punch altogether with green hand legs. A nice picture of a 1200, and it actually claims to be a BTM. It did have a drum that was located in the left-hand side of the cabinet on some engineer's facilities above. On the far side you can see the original senior tabulator and the, the actual computer box behind. It was not necessarily the most easiest of computers to drive. It was a not a nuts and switches, it was more a switches and neons machine, but capable, very capable. And as I said, the one that I met was a walnut carbon. And it was capable of quite complex work. Um, at Morgan I Carbon, it actually did calculations on the diameter of carbon moderator rods for nuclear reactors. It did crystal line density, and it also did packing calculations for powders because Morgan I Carbon basically sold carbon in any form. There's only one problem with our computers in carbon. Right. My thanks to Roger Johnson for this picture. You passed it to Simon, and Simon passed it to me. Wonderful to see, because this was indeed the, the box that I worked with Morris Devon. Um, and it was very much an open design. Uh, there was nothing to stop carbon power getting more as clean as you kept it. Carbon and high voltage was not a good combination. Um, when things got really bad, and one of the things I love about this picture, Roger, is the doorway behind the machine. Because I know that if I went through that doorway, got in the lift, went up to the top of the factory, there was the canteen, and there was steaming hot cups of tea, and if you work late, a, uh, a pie and chips. And sometimes sitting up there with Morris 
we could actually work out what the problem was when we got back down. And it was so much easier doing it up there than burning the fingers down here. So it was a capable machine. Are the drawbacks of the range? It was fully programmed. Data still needed to be prepared, and applications had to be prepared in punch machines all the time. It had limited drone capacity, which caused everything to be reloaded. They actually had a section on the programming sheet that said priming time, running time, and of course there was no unpriming time because you just overwrote it. But the speed of input and output was definitely limited by the mechanisms used, which were basically data processing. Reliability was a major issue. And these, I think, were unique to North Island Carbon. We actually had insulator rocks breaking down at high voltage because there were 500 odd volts in there. Connectors to and from input output devices become carbon dust fouled. If you actually took it out and laid it on the floor, <laughs> did it work? <laughs> it was, it really was. And do come in. Um, an actual migration of the silver from connectors passing into the body of Paxley connectors. I remember spending quite a long weekend with Morris when we actually ripped these out. So there were problems with the poor old 1200. Okay, so really the generation changes, and we're really talking about the, the time which is generation one to generation two, typified by the after transistor. I won't go all the way through them, but they are the main hitting points. But that was the transistors. Trump store to now program store. It's going to be called IS in this machine, but it is core store. A single serial data path to quad hexadecimal parts, and of course dedicated machines down to software-driven devices. And what we get rid of is the need to reprime data and the ability in the long term to add magnetic tape support. So the new generation's targets, the need to have data files and perform all of those basic punch card functions within one machine to retain the existing database. Drum store for rapid access is kept. Magnetic tape for really large tape files and the ability to take an output file and produce multiple format listings by just rereading the tape instead of running the files again. And the ability to extend files over many reels of magnetic tape. 26 reels was not unheard of at one of the sites. They actually heard all of the teacher database and the Department of Education and Science used to do sorts on 26 reel files. They used to last for weeks, but it did do the job. Okay, the design team. The newly formed RCT, Power Samus, form computer developments, a joint venture with GDC, and this is the punch from the designer himself because ICTs are GDC and all about building machines, and GDCs are ICT and you're all about building. And in the words of Dr. Bird, how wrong they were. <laughs> ICTL would, would actually supply the new line printer mechanism, which was the first. Uh, a redesigned card reading method and the inevitable polaris compatible card punch. Uh, the design team, where to work? Um, there was really more GEC people on the team from what we can see, so the decision was a GEC decision. And it was either Coventry or London, and they actually chose the Wembley Labs. I'm told by um, Dr. Bird that their initial location was in this part, which was pretty horrid, so excuse the uh, photograph of a Nissan Arctic because it's the start of the thread that leads to temporary buildings which runs through here. But uh, well done, Dr. Berg. Let's move on. We've tried to identify as many names as possible and Roger is incredibly lucky in as much we have a, an actual archive of most of the data. We've identified a lot of names, but the ones that really stand out, of course, is Dr. Raymond Bird himself. Uh, and David Lush's signature seems to appear all over diagrams. And it's the fact that it's one person and taking the dates from these diagrams has given us some of the chronology. I am not sure now, bearing in mind Anno Domini, just how many of these people are around. But Dr. Bird's of the opinion that he's one of the few. So we're only too glad to know these people actually were in there. Okay, internal politics strikes. We have one team down in London and everything they produce is vetted and revised by another team put together by GC, uh, two people called Colin Lance and George Nisman, and they will be in Coventry. And what they're actually doing, which wasn't too bad when we realised it, they were taking everything that the original design team produced and they were looking for trusted components. And it would appear that trusted components meant made by GEC. They wanted everything made by GEC and to a degree it worked. It was the design that was finally used. 
Tracing the hardware, the CDL team then did the diffuse initial prototype to what was then only a theoretical computer. They had at least five designs on paper. We think that they drew diagrams up for at least three. Uh, and the variations were for a basic punch card machine with no mag tape through to a mag tape machine through to a multiple peripheral structure. Um, lots of ideas, lots of designs on paper, but designs on paper need to be made into reality. What design tools did they have? Absolutely nothing. But there is a wonderful little story which was related to us by Dr. Burke when he visited us in 2004, and I will take you through that time of meeting. Apparently, either when they moved to Kenton or Harrow, there was a very, very large conference room. And what they needed to do was to check their ideas that given two signals starting off in different parts of the machine, travelling through the harbour and coming out the other side, that they'd got what we call today critical path analysis and flow right. And what they actually did is to actually set two people walking across the conference room floor across little diagrams of gates. And the theory was if the two people actually arrived where they were meant to go, they'd got it right. If two people tried to occupy the same piece of wire or even the same logic gate, they didn't. And I do understand that her hilarious time has had by all of them. I can quite see them finishing this and uh, going down the pub and scratching their heads. <laughs> One thing that was well planned, and there were tools, was the ergonomics of the machine. They very, very early got no London involved. He, I believe to this day, has produced a design that does catch the eye. Um, and eventually it was recognised, and there was indeed a quite remarkable award for that design, which covered the general design and the console. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Right. Uh, the two preceding designs came together, so basically the triple five and the 1200. Um, they, they were trying to maintain the decimal user interface for simplicity, and lots and lots of programmers that we've talked to say, well, it was so easy to get used to. Um, so that was combined with the simplicity of serial logic processing. But instead of processing one string, they were processing four. So if you take the parameters of 38.4 kilohertz in the 1200, one meg in the 1300, and stick that across four bits, it was actually a, a processing speed increase of about 104 times, roughly, or about 100. The designated word length had been settled on as 12 digits, and that's biased more to accounting, and it was really the market this machine was aimed at. The retained principles. The machine clock was still generated by a knock to a timing track on the drum pad. It's a basic principle of the 1200 range. Uh, the completion of a running program was signaled by the machine stopping, yeah, very, very quaint, but that's the way it did, and indicating an end condition. In the case of the 1300 basic, we just put a numerical value in the register. It was a surprise that all the native peripheral devices were designed as unbuffered. But again, that was a cost consideration, and that would be something that came back and bit them later in their life. It was regretted and corrected. Okay, so the prototype models were built. This is a photograph from a brochure which was kindly donated by John and has become almost the symbol of this project. Um, it was a nice model and a good guess. There's two very, very silly things which I will mention to the engineers in the room. If you carefully look at the console, the data keys and the control register has moved upside down. I don't think anybody's ever noticed that over the years. And the proposed tape control interface, which is a tiny bit of logic poking out the back, was a wish. It was actually about four times larger. But they had a model, they had a design, and they went for it. It had a basic register set, which I won't drag you into being too deep. It's an animated picture that comes up the website. You have a very, very basic register set. You have a register of 48 bits, which interfaces the core store, called IS, for historical reasons. <coughs> You have an accumulator register B and you have a register C. That gives you enough registers to do all the obvious things like addition, subtraction, and even multiplication. Um, one of the main things that I will actually focus back on later, but in another diagram, are the three controlled registers because this machine, when you look at the basic architecture of any machine, lacks a program counter. But then again, the 1200 never had a program counter, you have to tell you what it so we'll look at that in a minute, but that was the basic structure they set on. They set on serial communication between registers and ran by the mill, 
but of course parallel communication with the rest of the world. So the data registers and all of the registers had to be 48 bits, 4 bit serial by 48 bit parallel. No problem with the data coming out of a register that size, you just send it where you need it. It went three times to the printer to hit 120 hammers, it went twice to the punch to slam through 80 columns. The problem was getting the data into the register. And I wouldn't teach the CCS about having short bar stables, but a basic buy stable needs a lot of logic to steer three, four, or even five sets of signals into the same set of buy stables. And this is where GEC's experience really came in. And this is as technical as it gets. This is the actual buy stable we used in the register. And the two little blue fellows at the top in the left hand side are the only two transistors on the board. Uh, everything else is simple diodes, capacitors, inductors, and it's shades of radar technology applied to transistors. It's a pulse gate, and to this day, it's worked very, very reliably and very, very economic, <laughs> which is the most important thing as far as GDC is concerned. Okay, okay. Data flow parts again. We've mentioned the IAS. The interface between the store and register A is a parallel interface. Register B becomes the register that everything is thrown in and out of to peripherals. Uh, for a multiplication, yes, we use register C, but this is where they started to think about what they needed to do. You can actually set various devices going, and the data actually starts to build up in register C while you're doing further computation. That being the case, what you can actually do um, is actually wait till that's full, interrupt, and then grab it. But this is my chance, actually, to actually try and explain to you the significance of not having a program counter. We actually have three control registers, which are six digits long on the bottom, and according to that, occasionally you'll see an instruction pop round an incrementer, which you would need for a program counter, and then the instruction stored. So every instruction available in this machine is incremented and kept, it's not thrown away. Which means that you actually track addresses in more than one register. Trying to explain what how that works. Um, creating the hardware. Okay, of the prototypes documented, the CDL department team then did produce an initial prototype. Of all the designs produced, prototype number three came was the one that came out of the hat. It was the nearest of what they wanted. So now enter the GC factory staff in Coventry. They were tasked with taking the design that CDL had produced and producing a working machine. They had already pre-vetted it, so they did have a rough idea what they wanted to do. Uh, as far as we can gather it, the factory is located on Spawn Street, and there is a track record of employees in that area being very, very good with their hands, solving problems, and looking back through the uh, history books, they produced hand-finished watches, bicycles, they even produced other equipment over the years. Uh, but in 1958, they were producing mostly telecommunications, and it was a wide range that covered everything from the humble domestic radio issue to complete telephone exchanges. And it's the latter one that impacts on the design of the 1300. Factory photos. I thought this was pre war, but apparently, no, it's, it's about the right area. Coventry had a lot of war damage, um, there were considerable areas of devastation. And what amazed me was the health and safety in the workshop, like the, uh, the covers on the line shafts, and uh, it must have been quite a dangerous area to work. But as I said, telephone manufacturing was their main line, and the strategy switches were obviously the nuts and bolts. Uh, because of the variety of things they did there, somebody kindly sent us this one, and I didn't realise that where all of the GEC crystals in the machine were actually produced in the factory as well and somebody there is trying to work at the right angle to cleave a piece of quartz, which will then go on to actually become reference crystals sealed in a glass tube. So there's many, many skills in this building. Okay, uh, the most important thing in the GEC factory, as far as this was concerned, is they turned out their range of semiconductors, just what you needed for producing PCB. Given the start date, it was very, very difficult to really get something that did the job but they had one or two devices that did it. They did have an impact on the design of the walls, which I've mentioned. They actually managed to design that this complicated device came with just two transistors in it. Uh, they were germanium, they were PMP, 
PMP has problems which silicon doesn't suffer from. So to this day, we have to make sure that our machine doesn't get too hot or too cold when it's run. Uh, if it does, we can get problems. There is a very commonest transistor in the machine. It was specified only for radio frequency use, but not for logic switch. Some people have held their hands up when we tell them what we use it for. About mid-62, Mallard and GC joined forces in semiconductor production. So some of the boards actually have a mix of components. But the original spec transistors are working to this day. To give you an idea of what the factory actually did, uh, production put of his example. Out of 4,000 printed circuit boards which are needed in every 1,300, uh, there's an average transistor count of about five when you're trying to get the size. Times approximately 150 machines, so at least 3 million transistors to be manufactured to populate over 600,000 volts during the life of this production. Each PCB had to etched, drilled, populated, soldered and tested, and these were all hand tasks. They undertook a massive part. And that is, okay, it's, it's a ball which is actually chosen for impact, but we see GEC power transistors, GEC small blue transistors, transformers wound by GEC on a GEC's ball with GEC diodes with the occasional Muller component, and as Roger will confirm, there is 40 of these PCBs in the printer, and if this ball fails at all, it's the Plessy component that's fired. <laughs> <laughs> so they must have done it right. <laughs> Aspects, aspects produced at uh, GEC, well basically they produced everything apart from the mag tapes. <laughs> but they went in, they produced the semiconductors, the bulbs, the cabinets, the drum stores, the interconnection system. The drum being quite a, a complicated bit was suddenly given that you, you've got to create. The autonomous data transfer unit, this chunk of logic out the back that drives the mag tapes, uh, it was a major challenge for them. But as I say, everything except mag tapes, and in those cases, they actually chose Ampex for delivery. As far as the people were concerned, it was just a different exchange. You know, they built exchanges, it's a different exchange. It's a bit funny this one, but it's an exchange. So the cabinets were based on existing engineering solutions, such as the power supplies. Connections such as plug-in PCBs were soundly rejected, we are told. They were unreliable. Exchanges used wrap connections. So some said, we'll call plate connectors, and they went, gold, no, far too expensive. Um, so the standard in telephone exchanges was wrap joints, and that is what they used everywhere. The typical logic rack, it is slightly different to a machine that has plugging boards, because as you can see, a board actually slides into the gap, so the components are buried in the machine. What you get in the, in the cover on the 1300 is all of the connections. You can't actually work on the board, it's buried in the heart of the machine. But what you can do is you can access every pin, every voltage running into every board. But it does represent just a little engineering problem. How do you make a wrap joint? You take two pins, one on the board, one on the machine, and you wrap a little bit of tin cover wire around it. Which means you can't break the connection very easily, and that's the downside. You need a device called a wrapping tool to do it. And we'll come back to that advert which had to be put up to get our tools later. Uh, so the final prototype. Uh, now they start to take their exchange and put it all together and see if it becomes a computer. There's a CPU. The CPU is about 9 foot long, 4 foot high and 2 foot wide. So not a tiny one. They had a core store and control for that which is of similar dimensions. And to actually talk to the CPU, you get the CPU to talk to the core store, you need a control console. Now at this point you can talk to the CPU, you get the CPU to talk to the core store, but wouldn't it be nice if you had somebody to save the program? So you stick on the drum, and it's drum logic. Uh, and now you're almost into a computer. You had a card reader, card punch, it comes up, thank you. And eventually a line printer mechanism, and you have a basic 1300. Or is it sometimes it's worn out an electronic tabulator? Because that's all you've got. You've got drum store, but you've got no more facilities than you had with a tabulator. But what you do have is the ability to perform all of those basic functions within that machine. And this was the basic 1300 or so. But the majority have a MACTO controller, which was just a bit bigger than I planned. And uh, <coughs> one of the things that 
amazed me when I realised the design was the actual signal length runs within the machine. And why it was that shape? It is actually that shape, so you could open the doors to access nearly 4,000 PCBs. There's a lot of access required. The only time I've seen the equivalent is when Cray went round to keep the wiring short and the access easy. I won't compare this with Cray, but there are design considerations. It's this shape for a good reason. But the actual, please, the actual longest runs we can find between the drum store and the reader, the printer and the core store. And for those length of those runs to run at one meg, it's right near the limit. <coughs> Eventually, a prototype was delivered to Putney. I cannot identify an exact date for this. I really would like to find out. But the prototypes were <coughs> different to the early machines. They had, I won't say beautiful orange consoles, uh, but they stood out. They were good in prototypes. Um, I need to set your mind about what is the running machine in a prototype. This, of course, is a basic machine. I may mean, take um, I was very privileged that at least twice when the engineers were available with Putney, I was whistled in. It was quite a strange machine to look at compared to the production machine. So, the final specification. They had a CPU running at 1 meg, they had 3 48 bit data and analysis message registers, they had 3 24 bit control registers, a core store, and job on this machine, IS of 2000 words, a drum capacity of 12,000 words, line printer and card reader at 600 lines a minute, and the ubiquitous card punch. It was planned to accept up to 8 magnetic tape devices. And it sat neatly in a very tiny floor area of only 700 square foot. And um, when it sat there, it weighed five and a half tons and at three phase mains electricity. So it's not exactly a desktop. This is the one I was coming to, which is the one of the design which I did want to share with you today. Uh, the animated picture is actually again showing the control register changing from active paths to updated instructions. And because they chose this particular design to implement the way they counted their way through the program, you could actually track more than one address in the control registers. So if I move on quickly through that, they called it multiple address tracking. And a move board, it's a standard feature of the 1300, but it's implemented purely in hardware. Uh, if you take the first instruction to be the source area and the second instruction to be the destination area, we arguably say you want to move 20 words from 100 to 200, then when those registers have spun once, the 100 has become 101, the second one has become 102. All you have to do is forget the intermediate jump and you transfer another two words and you update the registers again. At the end of the count, you then allow that jump that would have taken you to those instructions through. Therefore, some instructions, because you're tracking more than one thing at once in those registers, are implemented directly in hardware. The move order in the 1300 is a typical reason why they went for that design. The same principle applies to shoveling information on and off the drum. You can shove it on and off the drum in 10 words or up to 200 words. And again, all the counting goes on in the registers. There was also the ability to record the address that was used to call a subroutine. There is no dedicated subroutine call function within the 1300. Instead, the start of a subroutine stores the address it was called from, so that it knows where to hand control back to. And that was only possible, again, by keeping the old updated instruction to point to the instruction beyond the one that called you. <laughs> So the first rule of any subroutine was to start with link. And also the ability to capture incremented last order pairs. That's a little bit exotic, but it's a side effect. So brief order code summary. Four range of arithmetic instructions, covering both decimal and sterling values. Standard logic and shift functions, a full set of arithmetic comparisons, the ability by software to test for the status of every peripheral condition out there on these dedicated devices because they were software driven. And that, in the standard configuration, was over 99 testable conditions. The result was total software flexibility, or as far as some structured programs are concerned, anarchy. Personal retrospective. Uh, the 13 one was physically the biggest <coughs> microcontroller 
I ever met. If you work with microcontrollers on pick chips, I've never met one of five and a half tons, but they're pretty good at Given its limitations and the wide range of actual computing applications it was applied to, yes, the original design team did get it right, almost. Software flexibility would produce a very, very open design, and it was possible to code things quickly. But to be an engineer, you had to be able to program. And the training was anywhere between 10 to 12 weeks. And one of your pass marks was, did your program, which calculated cube roots, actually work? And that was no subroutine. You had to write it all yourself. So there was a pass on this. OK, the achievement. Design started in January 59. We found a diagram which one month later was signed off uh, February 59, the earliest GC diagrams I've been able to find for a collection project is March 1960, roundabout. First customer delivery, number six, first mention of the machine that matters, final, October 62. Advanced delivery of serial number 150 plus, they're about the middle of 66. System cost range from the cheapest to the most expensive, around 120 to 250. With a working life duration, Best example of 13 years. These things did plod, but they haven't plodded. The survivors. We've actually come to the end of part one, and basically I want to talk about a machine that survived. So if this slide pops up a couple of times, I'll apologise. But now let's try and go for some video. Ah! The video is archive video. This is glorious quality video, I would hope, <coughs> but it isn't. You're going to have to put up with some wobbly pictures, some wobbly sound, but uh, it is worthwhile looking at. <coughs> Let's try and end this and get the first one up. Basically, this is production. We're not quite sure if this was Coventry or... Uh, Steve. Can you get it? Today is a fact. Right now in Great Britain, ICT 1301 computer is being produced in quantity. As the demand for this product for this skill and enterprise grows and grows, so too the output is increasing at an impressive pace. The other 1301 computers are undergoing their final systems test before dispatched to countries throughout the world. Precisely assembled, collectively similar. Each with a distinct character of its own, and each with an immense potential. By no means a bewildering complex of interlocking pieces, the 1301 is, instead, the result of forward-thinking technology and fine British work. It is an amalgam of concepts and techniques developed from ICD's extensive experience in the data processing field and supported by a comprehensive production plan. Manufacturing and assembly details are closely coordinated with meticulous test procedures. Just look at the wide diversity of materials involved. Punch cards. Tape. Tap. Rub. Copper wire. And cable. From tiny pieces of ferrite to materials of metal. Production methods equally varies range from exercise of simple crops to the application of modern automated production methods. And in some instances, they themselves are computer controlled. Thus, problems are resolved. The over 55 years of expert knowledge and practical experience stand square behind the development of the 1301 computer. The realization of data processing is not new. Forty years ago, electromechanical accounting equipment such as this was in common use. Here is an example of the early application of electricity to data processing. A simple electrical brush sensing device being employed to speed up the sorting of punched cars. Over the years, significant advances have been made. Photoelectric sensing, the displacement of the bell by the transistor, the introduction of the printed cell, the miniaturization of components, so that the greatest number may be packed into the smallest possible space. 
the exploitation of magnetism, leading to the development of high-speed magnetic tape systems. The 1301 version is designed to record up to 600 digits in every square inch of tape at a maximum tape speed of 150 inches a second. Magnetic tape units are subjected to progressive tests. These telnets, in a complete systems test, carried out under remotely controlled physical conditions of absolute permanence, ensuring that performance matches specification. Nothing is expected, nothing is left to chance. At every stage in the assembly of a 1301 computer, systematic and searching tests are carried out on each individual item and every single component. <coughs> Here, in the fabrication of the mechanical part, contained in its structure, there in the fitting of the electronics, and continuing right up to the proving of the customer's own selected program. During its initial assembly, test equipment designed to simulate the magnetic tape unit is linked to the machine. Later, this is followed by a reliability test employing the magnetic tape unit itself. Equally scrupulous attention is paid to the high precision engineering of all mechanical parts of the computer. Every costume is x-rayed before being machined. Rotation parts are dynamically balanced. Progressive inspection is persistently employed, since committed tolerances are minute, and operational conditions extremely demanding. A continuous 24-hour work test for each dumb unit at 6,000 revolutions per minute, with a rundown time of not less than 10 minutes, gives some indication of the exacting and precise work involved in the construction of each drum. To assemble 1301 computers in quantity is a substantial task demanding production control of the highest order. Let us look at just one example. Each basic computer is supplied with at least one magnetic drum unit. Each drum unit carries 288 read write tapes. To build each head requires no fewer than 36 separate operations. And up to eight such units may be specified for each machine. The production plan must of course take into account the movement of the assemblies and units so that they may be brought together in the right seat, at the right time, in the right place, and tested for reliability of performance. Electronically and functionally by virtue of a multitude of circuits and switching elements. A great number of people are engaged in implementing this production plan, a plan devised to meet the worldwide demand for the 1301 computer. Many skilled hands are busy, constantly bending, winding, selecting, wrapping, probing, assembling. Backed by extensive data processing experience, 
It embodies detailed research into the customer's individual problems, followed by computer education and training. Post installation, engineering, and maintenance services are fully covered. The facilities are a very extensive library of utility and subroutines. Auto coding systems and compilers are available. Step two, a programming help and advice. And so, needles quiver, lights flicker, patterns are placed on the telescope screen, metal is shaped as operators move levers, tip switches, in order that the computer's performance may be proved before leaving the production program. All ready to go to work. In this particular case, to work in a straight. Just one of the many 1301s ready to meet the exacting needs of the job. The job is to be called upon to do in industry, commerce, and government the world over. I will never know if that machine that we were showing down to Australia before we survived, because I'd like to think it was. Excuse me, Ronnie, before we get going with part two, just a little more slowly because I'm, I'm having a problem here hearing you. Like I'm okay, little, uh, so I'm missing a lot of your words. I, I will try and slow down, but I was trying actually to accelerate the uh, the window. I, I did promise Roger Johnson that this would have duration. <laughs> Don't worry. It's slow it down, Ron. Slow okay, it down. Yeah. I'm going too more fast. important the people hear you. My apologies. More important. <laughs> I will indeed. Excuse me. Here we go, part two. Uh, part two is really the working life of the machine. And the end of part two, I won't apologise for, but it's really uh, the thing that bound me to this machine, possibly to the end of the life. Let's find out. <laughs> uh, part two, the working life of the machines, uh, the range expansion and effectively the retirement of the range are encompassed here. Uh, the range was popular, no two ways about it. So, better all Yes, and, yeah, and when you face the audience, it helps more as well. Actually, I can't see the <laughs> <laughs> I know, I it's a problem. Uh, it was certainly used in a wide range of industries. It was within insurance, certainly accountancy, uh, education, not only at Senate House and London University, uh, but also in governments, particularly uh, buildings and works. Uh, and the law enforcement in metropolitan police and uh, shared with home, <coughs> several other implications. Um, I must admit the London population did represent quite a high percentage, nearly 10%. Uh, production of the systems fulfilled the original plan 50 systems. It exceeded the 50 carried on through the hundreds, <coughs> and every indication is that it carried on after the 150, and we just do not know how far. But that would be about the finishing time. It was certainly better than it was thought. Uh, the investment in software meant basically that there was money flowing back in, so some customers just paid out for a second machine. Um, the company was unable to produce enough systems with 1300 to actually meet demand. Demand for computing in this period was growing. Uh, but they did add to it a range of devices and also the cost reduced version quick comparison between 1301 and what was called the 1300. Uh, from an engineer's point of view, it was still basically the same machine. It still popped away at one bit. Uh, it had a smaller core store to start with. Um, the drum still maxed out at, sorry, uh, maxed out on the 1300 at three units of store, which was 1200 units, but the 1301 was allowed to rise to its normal limit of 2000. Um, the drum on the 1300 was half drum. Now this was <laughs> an engineering way of reducing the cost. Uh, the printer, the reader were half speed and the engineering joke beyond this was it was exactly the same mechanism but it was fitted with a larger printer on the input shaft so it ran at half the speed so it did half the work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, strangely enough, the, the machines that were run at the lowest speed actually were more reliable, they did not work. Um, there was a maximum figure meant to be of six decks on a 1300, but you were allowed up to eight decks at 90 gauge seeds on the full machine. So, just an approach, but they did introduce one or two other innovations about that time, which had been designed into the system. 
Um, they actually introduced the support for round hole cards, which allowed some of the 80 current pound Samus people to start to migrate their stuff. Um, paper tape support, which had been designed in, was demanded, so those mechanisms were delivered. Uh, magnetic tape drive support was expanded down to the lower deck, so you had existing one inch Ampex decks, existing half inch Ampex decks, 22s, and then these ubiquitous plastic reeled dry decks, but it was a sign of things to come. I don't have a picture of quarter inch decks, but uh, on the right you will see a one inch Ampex TM2 deck, maybe stainless steel. Um, Nice chrome fittings. Um, on the other side, two small trico decks with plastic reels and <coughs> little bits of rubber behind the back. So <laughs> it was the sign of things to come. But they were slow, they did the job, you paid your money and you got what you paid for. A typical customer installation. Uh, one which I recognise quite well, it was Lewis's Investment Trust behind Selfridges. Uh, the three things I'll point out is I actually knew this picture existed and owned the picture because I'm the man holding the ladder for the cameraman to take the photo. <laughs> <laughs> They're the kind of things you did on shift. Um, the other thing I'll point out is this one inch TM2 decks, these were the 90kc pieces, and there was actually another two decks just out of shop. But by the very, very right hand side, you can see the clock on the wall. It's gone half past nine, it's late nights. Already these systems are running two, three shifts to actually shift the work. And it is really the fact that the machines can shift the work, that they're constantly reloading. Um, I'm going to duck the story, Dick, you know the story, because I'm watching time now. Um, overseas and export, yes, they were to Libya, Switzerland, <coughs> Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, all over the place. They literally could not produce enough of these machines. The explosion in the machines fed back again on the software application market. So, the final range of software was extensive, but obviously pretty unique to the 1300, which tied customers into them, which could have been one of the reasons they worked for some more. Uh, there is a story buried in here. Um, yes, I will tell you. Um, in some cases, systems were sold under the strangest conditions, and ICL did indeed sell two systems to Poland for a quantity of Polish work tractors. Uh, it was actually quite a lucrative deal. Um, but the idea was that two systems went to Poland. Uh, it included the training the staff, the programmers, the engineers, and there was a senior instructor at Letchworth called John Buggle. And one day he came into the room at the start of the course and he said, uh, gentlemen, you're being put on your best behaviour because tomorrow you will be joined by a lady. Uh, if any of you step out of line and use inappropriate language or I get any complaints at all, you will be thrown off the course, sent back to your offices, and your own managers will sort it out because you will still be charged for the course. That really focused our minds. And sure enough, on the following day, Elizabeth arrived with her minder. Her minder was about five foot six tall, about four foot wide, and looked like an Olympic wrestler, <laughs> and didn't take part in the training. And in all deference to Elizabeth, she was a similar build. <laughs> <laughs> um, we watched our P's and Q's for about a week. Uh, we then discovered that Elizabeth smoked stronger cigarettes than we did. Uh, quickly adopted a flavour for English beer. Quickly became one of the lads. Uh, but her actual vocabulary was a bit limited. We, we needed to build this vocabulary up. So we brought our revenge by over the period of the three months of the course, teaching Elizabeth those very words that we weren't allowed to use around her. And this was partially done for a reason, being the way that she would go into this very, very girlish giggle when you explained what the word actually meant. And towards the end of the course, we realised we had uh, won when Elizabeth was using these same names back on us. So we, we returned the tables on the train. But uh, a very good course, that one. Um, software that was available, we've been able to identify the 1300 assembly system, certainly a mnemonic programming language. Mac also existed. Uh, a very, very early version of PERC, it's not exactly PERC compatible, but it was developed on there, and I think Hamish was involved with that. <coughs> and even Cobalt 561, uh, plus lots of specialised applications, but they were the, the main ones that we put on the list. 
uh, a working life of machines. Okay, the first credential to delivery was to London University Senate House, September 1962, and my whole first, there's an attached story, but I'll do it quickly. This machine was meant to be the last prototype, so it wasn't actually a production machine, but it was quickly refitted with those garish prototype consoles to a standard console, and was re routed into Senate House London University because Senate House London University said, if you don't deliver this machine, we can't take any students next year. We're going to tell the world, ICT, it's your fault. <laughs> so that machine got re routed very quickly. It was a prototype, but the first commercial delivery. It soon showed the fact that the designers had been quite good, but not particularly good. And uh, there were lots and lots of field modifications, which John, who's sitting in the middle of the room, will no doubt remember. <laughs> a highly modified machine. And eventually it settled down, and like most 1300s, it just plodded through the world. Uh, its main job in life was assigning students, ordering pencils, all the silly little things. It wasn't a star machine, but eventually it settled down and just plodded. Can I just bite in there? By all means. I believe my GCE pass slips were printed by that very machine from London University, as maybe were many of yours. Do you uh, mean the slot? No. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, this machine did have a little bit of history. Uh, in as much as once a year, it would put, put, print GCE pass slips. Uh, it was an annual event that was preceded by much tweaking in TLC, if I remember rightly, John. Much muttering from behind the printer, getting the hammers exactly right. But it, it also produced all the, the, all the introductory uh, material for the, for the London University uh, GC exams. So all, all, all the material went out to the examiners, for example. And in fact, I think all the parts, all, all, all the feedback from the examiners actually went through the machine. So it was quite a... a now this is something I didn't actually know it did. Well done, John. Well, or we'll, we'll capture that down the road in the engineer style. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier this year, we were very, very kindly given a scan of some of the actual GC certificate. His name seems to be a bit corrupted, but um, it was nice after nearly 44 or so years to actually read some crisp output from a printer that had actually been a live machine. Don't know who it was, but we certainly thank them very, very much. System software and limitation. As a single store program batch machine, the 31 was a solid workhorse. However, the original design specification was that the time share between computing and input output, but no hardware had been specified. The theory was to do everything in software using the software flexibility. What it actually needed was a package that would go in and at the right time read cards, punch, print, and then free off the computing cycle. And there was a holy grail which was to actually produce this package that did time sharing over the ba three basic peripherals, and it was called Print, Punch and Feed. It failed time after time, and that actually had a great impact on the usability of the system. Newer applications were added, the loading went up even more, this is only because the machines were popular. Very soon, there were no more hours in a day, and it was running five days, seven days by 24 hour cover. Uh, the time finally that had arrived to increase the system's capability. <coughs> Solutions to the PDF problem were really powered up, I think again Hamish was involved with this. And they did solve it, but the true story is that the version they took along to test that night failed as usual, but they had a rough idea sketched out in their back pocket, they sat at the console, they made the changes straight into the program, and Eureka, it ran. <laughs> PPF was solved more by accident than design. But PPF opened the door to the final solution. PPF <coughs> hadn't actually solved the problem because it was still using the processor. Throughput, the newer solution. The solution to the PPF problem then highlighted the real need to automate these input output streams. They were unbuffered devices, they took CPU time to drive. The magnetic taste system was an automated transfer device, but it did steal some CPU time to access the store to get the data in and out. And the real problem was that the process was sitting there waiting for the transfer to finish anyway. This was wasted time. So, input-output interrupt handling the forward wave of the 1300. 
uh, it was possible to arrange, if, sorry, if it was possible to arrange for the CPU to access the store when the CPU was actually running the data around those serial buses, then you could get that exchange in and not hold the CPU up. The only time you need to interrupt the CPU is when the CPU then needs to examine statuses at the end of the actual transfer. And if it was a bad transfer, sorry, if it was a bad transfer, repeat it. If not, then fire off the next transfer. But to do that, they needed more control. So they first expanded the core store and partitioned it. It went from a limit of 2,000 to 4,000, and then very, very quickly up to 16,000 words, and we're talking 48 bit words. Instructions were still limited to an address range of 2,000, but they, the whole program were paged in and out of the memory map. Um, okay, input out the interrupt down the, the end. Uh, the, free C, the free CPU loader, for this, as I said, they accessed it while it was still busy. Um, when the transfer completed, and only when the transfer completed, did the CPU actually stop running an application drop down to the control level, check everything was okay, and then come back. So instead of actually stopping and throwing lights up, which was the old way of driving the 30 numbers, we had a process that was running all the time. To achieve this, the system was enhanced and developed further by adding autonomous transfer logic into each device, not original devices, these are brand new autonomous transfer peripherals, and they're the start of peripherals that we meet later on. Interrupt handling. Then to control the paging system, and to drive the paging registers, new additional instructions are built into the hardware, and a system control program, which, strangely enough, is called executive, <laughs> was produced. This loaded from trouble system switch on and initialized the paging system, not only new attached peripherals and the older legacy devices. Finally, the 1302 had to be born to the problem was solved. <coughs> the newer innovations. <coughs> came with it. Program termination did not stop the machine, it dropped down to control level, program zero, which would then run the next task. Completion of an automatic transfer was another trip down to level zero and then back up again. And the 1302 as it was captured. Now we believe these photographs were taken at Coventry. We're not even sure of the date, but they have come up and they are nice to see. It's a 1301 slash 130 console. And beside it is the 1300 typewriter, which is a typewriter and not a telly type. It had a carriage and it did thump back on for every line. But if you look <coughs> just beyond the typewriter, there is what will become known as the 1911 1000 minute card reader. Or to an engineer, the combine harvester. There was so much metal flying around under that cover that it was unbelievable. Um, but that is a fully buffered automated device connected to a 1310. <coughs> Uh, the one story I will tell you is that the 1,000 minute card reader was very impressive, uh, but uh, being engineers, it played up. It wrecked so many cards, there was at least five cards in the track if you had a card wreck, so it wasn't one card you had to do, it was five. Uh, that the engineers would often go under the cover and switch it to <coughs> half speed. Uh, 500, it worked perfectly. <laughs> A slightly overcomplicated device. Another shot of the 1302, and this time the 1302 pedigree is proven again by the 1900 devices. And as far as experienced eye can see, there is nowhere in the 1300 to start incorporating extra logic. So you start with a logic built literally four inches off the floor, as you can see there. The one I love about this particular shot, and I do not know the man at the console, is I like this pose. IBM, I have stolen the Think logo, but by God in this industry, that's what we did. And we just stared at the paper until the numbers suddenly <coughs> made sense, and we've all done it. Uh, the last one is scary for an engineer because it's a 1302, and attached to it, I believe, is a potter deck. Plastic reels, horrible springs. This is what was coming um, half inch standard tape. It was compatible with the industry, but when you looked back at the Rolls Royce build of Ampex decks, this was a bit of a shock. <laughs> Hope you don't. So the manufacturing life, it was shortly, no specific end date can be found. The design was certainly terminated for the 1702. New range is 1900, was certainly coming down the track. Uh, however, when the first 1300 was installed, the order book shows about 40 systems, so there was a potential one for it. Remember, it did one for 150. 
The first 1900 systems, I believe, were delivered about mid-1960s, certainly the Robin Knight Carbon Machine went in about that time. Uh, at least two thirds of one systems were delivered new, and that could be new in inverted commas in 66. However, the problem with 1300s is they just ran and ran, and that did become a problem. Uh, come on, please, thank you. Uh, as I've said, the demand for communicate capability in this period outstripped the ability to choose. The order book was growing, customers would be lost if we didn't have hardware, we just could not make them. So the decision on the small end was to market the RCA 301 systems, the ICL 1500, and you know this machine also appeared as the Ball Gamma 30, a piece of RCA kit which actually socked up the small customers and meant we didn't lose money. But here we move into people trying to keep these machines running 24-7. Uh, within the London area there was a large quantity of systems. The engineering course on 1300 was basically tied to the systems we couldn't move off. And there was a bit of a, an October revolution when large quantities of beer was purchased by Bernard Home to keep us all happy. <laughs> But we did eventually get some promises that engineers would move on as systems change. Uh, one of the first sites to move, surprise, surprise, was the Senate House, the same system serial number that was first delivered. A long weekend was spent moving the 1300 out of the way to make room. And eventually, there's the poor old 1300, and through the glass, you can actually see the decks of the 1900, which is powering away in the background, going to take the work right over. Now, the next section contains frightening scenes of extreme distress to computers, conservative uh, conservationists, and people who have a feeling for pieces of hardware. Um, but that is what happened. Uh, the data migration initially, oops, nasty, how do you migrate data from a 1300 to a 1900? It was meant, really, to move to all the work over on 1302s, but there were so few of them, there was no time available. So I'll let John confirm, but I believe most of it moved over at car pack level at uh, the house. Mm. Uh, they did actually solve this problem because it was a problem by retrofitting part of the 1302 interface back into 1300s towards the end of the life. Okay, the first system retires. After migrating the workload, the Senate house needed to be dismantled and disposed of. The ICO put its little bill in, which I think was somewhere in the region of about 350 to 400 pounds. This would have been the end of this story today had that been happening. However, instead, the data processing manager of Mr. Hutt uh, at Senate House was approached by a certain group of students, went by the name of Galdor, to buy the Atari 1301 system and reinstall it. Given the choice to buy ICT ICL and actually make the scrap money out of the machine, he made the right choice as time has proven. Um, this piece of news actually reached the engineering force, and for some reason I don't know, I was elected to go and chat to the students to convince them they didn't need to do it, they shouldn't do it. Uh, I must admit I wasn't totally biased with the management view, and could any money be made out of helping them? Uh, on that day, I was convinced that I would advise the students not to try to do the task, and I'm very, very glad to stand in front of you today on the last line and say on that day, I completely and utterly failed to convince the students not to do it, and the fact that they did do it is now so important, I am very, very glad. <laughs> okay, as much for penance as I was detailed to be uh, the watcher on the day, and it was also a chance to talk to these students when they came in and removed serial number six. The removal weekend dawned, and people appeared from everywhere. I was amazed at the number of people that came into that room. I'm certainly past the number of 10, but everywhere I look were people taking things apart, photographing everything, uh, with, with great verb and uh, veracity. In fact, as I say, extreme scene compliance computers were not unknown in that room at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never know if it was staged, but it certainly is a bit extreme. It's actually the control console laid forward with somebody standing on the back with a hacksaw. But uh, there were a lot of things happening in that room. Uh, the students had a long job, they kind of capped out, and uh, being the kind of person I am, I kind of stood there and watched. I don't think I did much on the day. In fact, I found this, and in the middle of the picture is one Mr. Hunt in a nice dark uh, jersey. The next no, that's Mr. Midwick of the UK Tank. Oh, sorry, okay. I, I actually thought it was Mr. Hunt. Uh, and next to him is a slightly younger version of me, who is 
religiously not touching anything because I was told to look. But I must admit, there were one or two jobs that I thought, we don't have, I'll never get it done again. So eventually, there I am, stuck in the console, taking out, I think, about 800 connections. Now, when these looms came <coughs> out, it was like wrestling with an octopus. And unless they were marked, there was no way this poor old machine was going to go back together again. So I did get stuck in eventually, only for a little while. OK, eventually, all done, job done, ready to roll, off she goes. They had to clear the room, but what to do with the machine? Good question. A handy garage. <laughs> the machine was pushed into at least one garage, if not two, and that's where it stood for a period of time, to the shall we say. Preparing the site and the building, over the following months I was updated by the outdoor. The purchase of the garden behind the flat, the clearing of the garden, the several beer and concrete parties needed to lay a base, and then purchase of exchanging mark of an old prefabricated building. Here we go back to the theme, guess what? One of those. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually did a very good job. And I think cost about 200 pounds. Final delivery, probably midnight, Surbiton High Street. Somebody has a 1300 console, but it won't go through the door. Very bad picture, but they're actually hacksawing the runners off job. They were determined to get it in. <laughs> A few sums. If you wanted to own a 1960s computer, it would cost you £200 for the machine, £200 for the building. Uh, judging by your drinking habits in the past, you are, I think that £30 is not too excessive. Cement and a lot of blood, sweat and tears. The, the students put a lot of work into recovering the machine. OK, so lives in the stars a little bit lighter. Um, most machines, of course, were actually scrapped. And as they were scrapped, one thing about the machines actually appealed to all the engineers and apparently appealed to a lot of other people, and that was the console. The console had won a design cut off the wall. So they started to appear. And over the years, we've played Spot the Console and join in. Doctor Who. <laughs> Down on the left is a 1300 console. <coughs> Blake 7. Two consoles. <laughs> At least two more. <laughs> well, they loved them in Blake 7. And another one. And now it gets serious. We have a Bond film. And Roger Moore has his own console. <laughs> and so does Christopher Lee. The one thing I love about this film is there's a mixed feeling because there is an explosion behind the two consoles uh, halfway through. And half of me is mortified that two 1300 consoles appear to blow up. And the second half is deeply satisfied. <laughs> Uh, the last one spotted was in Return of the Pink Panther, and if we were doing a um, pantomime here, we'd have to say to the man in the white jacket with the logo, it's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm a little star. Okay, the students continue. I was based at Tin Tadger House and worked across 1300 and 1900 ranges. I had to return on return of weeks to keep that 24 hour cover up. And then the end of these weekends, I would occasionally allow myself a Galdor day. If I could go over to Galdor. Um, I didn't actually hit the deck with the hammer, but so uh, they were fun days. But you can see the way things are building up. You have spare racks on top of the decks. Uh, this is the interior of the building when it had been installed and the system had been installed. The system installed quite well, apart from the fact the printer didn't quite fit and had to be cranked at an angle. Uh, but there were many modifications to this system while it was in the outdoors hands. And then the thing separated me from this machine, and the incident took place was the official words. The building you're looking at is Tin Tattle House. It's a clad building from the first floor upwards. The ground floor is brick built and if you look over at the other side at the entrance you'll see the ground floor have very, very tall windows. There were two systems in there. The system on your right was the first machine and the customer's workload had increased to the point where they bought a second machine. The first one was a round serial number 40. The new machine was around serial number 80 that happened with the like of the machine. And they ran five days by 24 hours cover. That week, on the Friday, 21st, I was working the late shift with the room staff, and as was our want to be <coughs> finished, we retired to a hostelry to discuss the forthcoming weekend and what had happened, and then we departed home. What we did not know is that we had been watched, and the watcher returned about 22.30, is estimated, and placed a small package on an outside window ledge on the river side. Following morning, BBC Radio told us that an incident had taken place 
And what had happened was they had placed a bomb on that windowsill. It took out two windows, it took out a brick pier, and I was left in a quandary because I was on 24 hour cover all over the weekend for all of the machines. They weren't actually on cover, but I just thought we're going in on Monday to two completely blown up computers. And uh, after a brief conversation with my manager who said, don't go anywhere near it, I decided I'd go in and have a look. As I was travelling in, I had a mixture of funny thoughts in my mind. You don't have two dead 1300s. Uh, you don't have a place to work anymore. Um, you don't have a job. <laughs> but the one that actually drove me in, I realised, was there was a tiny PCB in the engineer's desk. It was the early days of biotransistor logic. And having built this board, recovery of the board was more important than any of the other questions. <laughs> the total damage. Two machines, over 4,000 PCBs per machine, the first machine was covered in dust, vacuum cleaned up, started running its test program straight away. The second machine had a single ball that was just cracked. I must admit, I am the one that bent the ball just to prove the point. Um, there were some pretty bad marks on the covers of the machine, but it had survived. And we think that wasn't actually hit, but the ball had actually whipped in the ball of crap. Um, that is actually placed on the windowsill as was before the bomb, or sorry, after the bomb went off. You can see the pop marks from the amount of rubbish that flew, flew around. It was photographed by the police incident people and the board was then taken as part of the investigation because they wanted to know who had done it. Um, a later part of the story is the photograph that I was given here is what I have left and uh, it's almost goonish what I had to do with the photo. Um, Okay, so we were hailed, myself and my manager, were some kind of hero. Then somebody said, why did you go into a dangerous situation? Which was actually quite sane. Um, but then letters arrived, many, many thanks, so we just quietly got on with life. Uh, or we would like to, we weren't allowed to. No such luck. Still was wanting that PCB back, but I couldn't have it. It was part of a major police investigation. Uh, and I actually ended up giving stores a photo of the PCB as you would in a goon show almost. Um, there were a lot of angry people. Not least was John Walker, the commissioner. He was met police. And well, these buildings have just been blown up. Uh, the existing investigation, ongoing investigation, bombings across the country, had extra staff thrown into it, literally within four days. And then the whole incident being removed into ten tables perhaps. And I do wonder if it was a case of protect yourself. <laughs> You're the instant guys. Find out who's doing it. Protect yourself. The angry brigade were actually the people that had done it. It was not so much the angry communications. The top line actually explains why it was done. They were trying to make a point. The one that really drove the police around the bend was the lower one because it made them terribly, terribly paranoid about everybody. And the way it ends, power to the people, is sounds a bit jokey, but that is literally the communicator the angry brigade sent out. The fallout. Uh, I used to spend some time with civil defence, and I know that if the, the main bomb doesn't get you, then watch out, the fallout will. And it was the fallout that got many in this incident. That's not the incident, but it's an incident only from a police journal at the time, which I actually scanned. The detectives, they're simple enough people, they're after doing a job, so it's most probable that the butler did it. And if not, then it's most probable they needed inside information. And everybody else in the building is their own staff. So, who were the visitors? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> many, many long talks for the people who used to work in place over the next few months. Someone found I had a connection to Galdor, and I was asked a very, very direct question. Did I know what clients the group had? And the answer had to be, uh, no, go. No. Did I know they supply computer services? National Council for Safety and Liberties, and the legalised cannabis campaign. <laughs> uh, no guff, but it was not, shall we say, establishment accepted. But like the machines, I also supplied eventually, cleared, uh, it was never considered pure white, but it was basically on the understanding that we did not contact Gallagher again. So I apologise to Stuart Fox since I retired. So my clearance was then revised to a very high level because the whole building got parallel in terms of everything. And I'm happy to say that clearance actually was for the better of me through my life. 
Uh, one of the main arguments that I could throw back was if I wanted to blow up these computers, I would never have chosen that space because the blast just emptied into the profile of the machine. I'd moved a bit one way, I'd taken the drum out, I'd taken the fridge out, I'd taken out the de tape decks. Go in between the machines, I'd taken the tape library out, that really would have been no idea. <laughs> okay, so detail of house closer. After migration, the workload moved after the 1900s around me. Yeah, 74. I didn't go to the party for. <laughs> it was just a very, very strange place to be. It was far too secure. After the closure, I was finally free to be away from 1300, so I actually moved 1900 to 1900. But that was actually, fortunately, not the end of the story. And we've got a short video, video two. Roger, are you still concerned about time? It's a very short video, but uh, it's quite pertinent. Stop hitting that button and I'll start hitting that button. Very short, but uh, slightly better quality. From this complex case, thanks to computer and second generation, it offers forward thinking organization, a comprehensive data services system at lower cost. It has been developed to satisfy the requirements of a wide variety of applications.
But I'm going to say, you know, yes. Well, I think with Gene's help, I'll be able to talk about it. Yeah, but that's the impressive one. Right? So what will you do to refuse it? So that's a very important question. But first, uh, let's start by taking one of the pictures of the machine, the reading of new data. Very right, I'm going to that. The computer complements the operations of business at all levels. For instance, routine documentation of day-to-day -day work. And the executive control to ensure that management policies are being followed. And it gives the information from which management can determine these policies. You know, when you look at it this way, there's something very inspired by your friend's mind. But 1301. <laughs> Sorry, you see what I want to do. Your friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the pub is approaching right. Uh, we've actually been through everything now apart from the surviving machines, which is one of the things I'd like to talk about now. Um, there are actually four surviving machines in the world that we've been able to identify, and there's something that's got one tucked away somewhere. Uh, so I'd like to talk about my personal retirement, the rediscovery of 1300, the project that was formed, and really what we do in the future. Uh, there is a little bit of video at the end of this because I thought the person that's in the video should have the last word in this design. So let's get underway. Um, surviving machines. The Tygo Settlers Museum in New Zealand is a machine. Uh, Iconic I in Grenoble. Uh, it's contacted, but we believe the machine is still there. And at Bus Farm, serial number 75 was purchased for stairs, I believe. Uh, now at uh, TLC Alpha and Buzz Farm Flossy, which is the project for the 1399 Resurrection, it is the original Serial Number 6 that was almost a prototype. Uh, it has now survived far too long, 47 years, since it was put on the floor of Senate House, and it is the focus of the project that Roger and I drive. Okay, survival of the fittest, a quick run down. New Zealand, Serial Number 50. Three, it was moved to Hobart, then it moved to Perry Schweppes. I'm told by the engineer the installation was started the day JFK was shot. I'm not quite sure if that was a good or a bad sign. It started productive work in December 63 and it ran for 12 years. Once you got the work on the machine, it was very, very hard to replace, but they did actually plod quite well as machines. When that museum folded, uh, it was actually moved to its final settling place at the moment, the Tago Settlers Museum. Um, it's in the hands of the Information Technology Heritage Society of New Zealand, chaired by Professor Brian Cox. Bruce McMillan, and some of you met when you came over on the day we visited the project, is the ICL engineer, and I understand to be quite kind to several of our other projects. Uh, he has been quite avid in his collection of equipment in New Zealand, and they're now cataloging over 2,500 items on their catalogue. Uh, the 1301 is the key item when you visit the museum. Uh, I know this is a flatbed scan of a picture of a paper, but it actually shows that 1300 was delivered, and Professor Cox is the one nearest my good self, and Bruce is on the other side. What I love about this picture is all machines have to die. And on the other side is a 360, so we believe it's in good company. Uh, but it was actually put back together and it was taken apart and the chrome parts were re-chromed and the painting parts were repainted and it looks like that. Which, going back to the original design and the kite marker wall, kind of looks great, it does make quite a centerpiece to when you use That's the nicest one before. <laughs> Iconic in Grenoble. Uh, the machine past is a little unknown. Serial number, I've been given three different serial numbers, so I'm not sure. It spent over five years at the time for the Phillips. It's that same thing. But it's now moved out of cover, and although we have no direct contact with the Phillips, it has been spotted in visitors' photos, so it's your last chance to play Spot the Concert. And at the fingertips of the man taking the group around is a console in the background and right up against the wall is the rest of the cabinet, so we believe it's undercover now. Uh, Aconit do actually have connections, I was told today, with various societies, so there may be other ways of getting in touch with them. <coughs> One of the things that Roger and I like about it is they did the evaluation of the system, and they actually transcribed some of the very, very basic test programs to PC files, 
and they have the same PC files that Roger and I recently reloaded to prove that our core store was working. So we, we are great thanks to Agony for not letting it help us. Um, current state unknown, but restoration is an impossible the Agony story. Uh, they have quite a collection of hardware, and their website has the following picture on it. Quite a range of kit. Um, I believe we have the file back just under the ball going 30 word, or actually the 1300, but it actually says ICT 1400 off to the side. So I really am desperate now to find out if the machine's still there. We think they may have mislabeled it. We hope they haven't mislaid it. <laughs> we hope it's still there. Okay, and this is where things start to come together. Eventually, Galdor finished using their 1301, and it's a freebie. Free 1301. This page was in the Computer Club newsletter April 1976, and it's actually described as a cheap and cheerful, which I suppose is quite fair, commercial design, uh, central, uh, sorry, air conditioning definitely not required, it says in the middle. The drawbacks are size, 700 square foot, and three flights. Galbell can offer suggestions for these. So that was the advert that Roger Holmes responded to the Stuart Fulton in the King, and eventually that same system ended up at Pass Farm. Pass from Galbell, transferred in 76. The owner of Roger Holmes he insists he bought it as a home computer. <laughs> <laughs> Machine came with many spare parts of Galbell purchased to keep the system running. Oh, with a very complete set of documentation. However, let's do the sums. Eight years at London University, at least five years running at Galileo, that's 13 years this system ran before it went there. We're not counting in any of the years that it's done at last long. And as if to keep the traditional portable buildings going, Roger housed it in a shed. <laughs> a very big shed, but again, the portable buildings there. Early days of past farm, I was not involved. Roger actually reassembled the system. Then came the question, what do you do about three-phase power supply? And he was given a price for running three-phase all the way down the road to the farm. And that was very expensive, but there was an alternative. How about three-phase diesel generator? <laughs> which is what powered the system for quite a while. It's now on live three-phase, but uh, that was quite a challenge. You're quite fine when you come back. But honestly, I may have got the date to you. Uh, so, on or about 1989, was that about when the CCS was formed? Uh, the system at Barge Farm was pounded out for a long rest. The farmer had another more important event ongoing. It was changing the focus of the field in the Darling Buds of Maine. And I have to say, I totally agree with logic. Given the choice of looking at Frosty or Catherine's into Germans, uh, the applaud your choice. <laughs> Uh, when the filming of the three series published, Fossey was beginning to show <coughs> very, very bad signs of being very inoperable. So the, the start of the fellow season. I retired May 2000, uh, far too many years from the company. Still working in London, with locations with private security clearance, and life, life was really like such as, why are we looking for this machine? I have it, I think. Really nice. Because I was consistent convinced that it had to have been scrapped. It was a lot of metal. But I did need to know. I really did need to lay this started project to one side. And I contacted an organisation called the CCS, and they very kindly pointed me in the right direction. I was told where it might be. Uh, thanks also go to the internet and allowed me to find the signature line of an individual who signed his email strangely and I still find who took up computing because it was supposed to be logical. Google found that a unique search string <laughs> and it pointed me back to the fact that Galdor still existed. At which point I was in touch with Roger Holmes and we spent a long while sending emails between each other at the time of 2002, early 2003, and I established the numbers of facts. The machine was actually in one of these. Wow. The machine has been part of that. Wow, there was documentation, there was original contact libraries. The system was within driving distance just, and then you look at it, you can keep the running again. So I had to make a big decision, and I'm uh, very glad I did. That big decision was that in early 2003, my wife and I went down there, and enough of the machine worked, or tried to, on that day, many minutes were started the recovery project. Um, 
if you look on top of the machine in those days, the, the racks of spare balls were just piled up. Um, an estimate is that at that point in time, Fossey was there, after the spares, that was a whole machine, and we had another half a machine spare logic, about 2,000 balls. So when you're entering a project like this, to be told you've got lots of spares, really does make it happen. But where to start? We needed specialised wrapping tools. We didn't have them. We had missing information, missing history, and how to promote support was our big thing. And the solution was I took the corner of the private website and I made it 1300 resurrection project. Uh, we needed wrapping tools, so this email and uh, request went up on the site, and wrapping tools turned up. John that actually donated it. We, we had wire turning up, spare parts, engineering, and putting these in trials of the same the first year, it was slow to start. The project was being supported by retired local engineers. Tools and all kinds of sorted bits turned up along with best issues. And slowly I realised the power of this little corner of a website. Um, and it was time to build a new website. That's where I see certain and the came from. And to expand on that existing support network. And I use the words intangible but ever present. You could not touch the support, but whenever you put your hand out and said help, somebody tried to help. And at one point, and I've not discussed this with Roger, it was referred to indoors as the ghost squad. They couldn't come and join us, they couldn't give a hand. There was lots of people out there that was willing this project to go, and that really did drive us forward. Um, I would literally, as I say in the top there, I would post it on the website, and within a few days you'd get somebody coming along and saying, according to my diagram, who did happen? Yeah. Try this. So we had many, many, much, much support from the ghost squad. Uh, and in one case, one of the contact teams was far away in Singapore, but we're still putting ICT 1301 into the web and getting hits and saying, how are you getting on? So with that kind of support, we pushed. Uh, first open day could give us a bit of a mistake, because it actually turned out to be one of our uh, better decisions. The signal would just go open the doors and chuck it just part of the reaction. It was superb on those first days, and I haven't <coughs> fiddled with it because we actually added the numbers up about three months ago. And we've actually had 1305 logged visitors. We've had many who haven't, but we've actually exceeded the counting machine, which isn't bad over five visits. Uh, year on year progress so far, uh, by the end of 2003, we had some basic sequence data files. Then we finally got the meal restored, and we could run our first loop. Uh, we've slowly built the core store back up to the nation year on year, so 40%, 80%, now we have 100 Our first magnetic tape read, wow, wasn't that a step forward. We finally got the card reader fully working. Uh, at the end of this year, we are awaiting the test of the data interface to actually get software out of the machine. But we need to hit 100% of all of the components to start this process. And who knows, hopefully by the end of 2010, we'll actually start to pull this data off. The highs and low points which I'll share with you has to be the first run program, certainly the first run access and eventually recovery of the system bootstrap. First magnetic tape access was, was quite amazing, and I do mean a proper tape access, not just bits, but we actually managed to decode the words. And of course, finding a new home for Arthur, which gave us so much more space and changed our environment drastically, from actually working in a very tight environment, we suddenly have a lot more space. The lows, sorry Roger, the bird's nest. I know we couldn't make it. Apparently a window broke sometime during the life of the machine, a bird found away and then the covers were off. It actually nested over the top of the drum logic. <laughs> Roger took the nest and threw it away, good, but unfortunately it had been there for possibly years, and parts had fallen all the way through the logic board. So, uh, the power supply burn-up, which was a side issue, and the current one is called the logic burn-up. I'll share with you the bird's nest, <laughs> as seen inside a logic rack, and to actually get the logic rack is a lot of out is a lot of work. Uh, we believe the bird's nest is finally gone. Uh, the current problem is that a fully working machine will suddenly grind to a halt, and somewhere in all of this hardware, a signal has been sucked down the ground and on the right hand side is burning up the black inductor, it should look like the other one. We've currently got the machine set up as the biggest logical mousetrap I have ever missed in my life. Um, should this fault decide it's going to return, and it may be temperature constant, we run around, we pull wires off, 
we push separators in until that component stops burning up and we know where the mouse is. But strangely enough, when you set a mouse trap, isn't it strange that I know mice come along? This machine has been like this now for three months and it will probably have to overwinter like it. The one thing about it is the bulb is actually illegal as much as it's reverse negative, hanging out the vision so we can see the bulb. Because when this first happened, all we had was a burning smell. Where? Because you can't see the contents of the bulb at the time, so you it burning. So the mouse trap still sits there, and hope the mouse comes on sometimes soon as we can lay this one. Current status in 2009, we've always had three targets, and we are certainly at 4% after the day that we always were going. Target 2 has been met, we have a new home for Arthur, so that's 100%, we've certainly delivered the open days. That is the machine, and I have to be totally honest on a very good day, because those of you that have visited have realised that it is a working environment. Um, this picture was also taken by Roger and slightly cleaned up, and I believe it's the one that went out to Professor Hazel uh, for inclusion in the book, if you want to see. Um, the machine has a new configuration now we have on space. It is lined up with a maximum number of decks, of which we have about 75% really at any point in time. And suddenly you can access a lot more space around this machine. But we work in association. Uh, Arthur has moved to a new home in Cumbria, late in 2008, and taken again as a main focus for production. The website is Timeline Archive, as it calls itself. This machine is restorable and could be taken to the museum. Other projects we've used can only stay in touch, but we do things like transcribing the tapes, to and from PC files, cards, genuinely supporting each other. And this is the TL archive website, which was recently launched, and there is poor old Arthur in bits, but the centerpiece is going to be, and if you really do want to get up there, perhaps we might want to do it together. Yeah. Right, so hi to Arthur. I think I've actually seen things like sorters and all kinds of goodies up there, so I've got to go find it, it's worth having in. My own creed on conservation. Do it now, not later. Who knows? You may not be able to do it later. Bring all your supporters together. Show people what we're doing. Ask why you want to get it. Share everything and let people decide what story relates to them. We get programmers coming back and then we get website. We get there, we get engineers coming back and we get users coming back. Just by putting everything up on the website, they decide what part of the person is doing. Keep everyone informed in an open way. And I see two thirty in the one that code up and play was the key to all of the project's focus. System information available online, software recovery. Software recovery, and it's just possible that we're talking about we can deliver a view of what it was like to actually use the program in the 1960s to be interactive. And that was really based on Doran's article of virtual machines as opposed to the actual machines, <coughs> which is why. Sorry, data contact, we are promoting conservation, emulation, and information exchange. And what do we see our future in with the CCS central papers on board? Certainly the emulators need to be finished. Program to data pack recovery. Certainly manual publication. We're on about our fourth manual now. And I'll sort out my internet access problem. And CCS advice about what we should do in our long-term plans. Because we have hit a lot of our original targets. And I won't keep the wrong, but I think the final words on this presentation should go to the designer Dr. Bird said when he visited in 2004, but the environment here is not as cool as it is today, so let's find out what Dr. Bird had to say. And I think he said it all, and never there's a chance of Dr. Bird coming back when we work on that. So, very yeah. well. oh, Welcome, Dr. Bird, to the 1301 Resurrection Project. Thank you very much indeed. We are very, very happy to have you here today to celebrate 
the life of this machine and your design. The two reunited today are very, very pleasing. Would you please tell us a little about the history of this machine? Well, I was involved because I belonged to a company called CDL, which was formed half from GEC and half from ICT. GEC felt that ICT should know all about marketing computers, and ICT thought GEC knew all about producing them. How hard they both were. But we were formed at Kenton in GEC Research Laboratories to try and see what was needed in the computer field. We put up three projects. P3 was the project for a commercial machine uh, for ICT to market. ICT had huge computers, uh, sorry, punch card installations, all of which were vulnerable uh, to poaching by IBM and other people. So it was vitally important that our biggest customers had some way of migrating towards uh, the company rather than going to build. So we designed this machine that beat as it squeaks, as it clicks, like hoops. It fed a car while it computed, while it pumped, printed or punched out the output. And that was the vital thing, to get the, the throughput up. It's interesting to note that it uses rat joints because GEC research laboratories and GEC telephone works commentary evolved them to do away with plugs and sockets, which were possibly the greatest source of error uh, and unreliability in computing equipment at the time. But the field engineers didn't like the back joints because they felt how the hell we had to service this machine because they were used to plugging things in and out to service it. But nevertheless, it seems to have settled down and uh, the reliability of it was extremely high uh, because the, the uh, unreliability of plugs and sockets was removed. Uh, the appearance of the machine was one of the things that the boss of CDO, local Dr. S.P., insisted that we not write from the word go. So he employed an appearance designer called Nal Lappin, who was brilliant, and he was far more than an appearance designer. It, it was all worked out ergonomically where things should be at one height, how everything things. He, in particular, designed those knobs because he felt they, they shouldn't just be nerve knobs, they should have something you can get hold of and twist it. And that would indicate by the scope what number they were selected. Um, it's lovely, absolutely brilliant to see this machine again after what's nearly 50 years and thank you very much for the opportunity of coming down and seeing it. Well, thank you so much for coming. We have a slightly more extended version of the history of this machine in as much as we are so lucky today to also have one of the first engineers to actually work on it. John is now joining us. So we now have the machine. We now have John. John remembers the machine within London University. Um, and we would actually say to John, thank you for driving all the way down that you did today. We don't think we're ever going to get the chance to get such a combination of people together again. So thank you for coming, John, and thank you so much for your donations to make this project work. Well, I'd just like to add the last one for the people that evolved this lot, and, you know, I'm on the way out, I'm 1981, so you're quite right. <laughs> As an engineer myself on this machine, uh, the history of the machine continues to roll on after London University, and I would ask Stuart Fife to join us to represent Geldor, the group that took the machine on. Um, I am well aware that when this machine left its pristine environment that, uh, shall we say, there was a lot of concrete and beer parties and shed building to house the machine. Uh, and it's so great to see you back down here today. Uh, while you're down here, we're going to ask you to explain again some of the very special ones that Plossy had. <laughs> <laughs> and now, if we're really lucky, the machine is currently in the hands of Roger Holmes, and we must thank Roger for owning Flossie, for caring for her, and actually completing the link, which is, as the designer said, now 50 years from inception through to its history, through to today. Now, if there's anybody else hiding away, it's your time for a group shot if you want to be on board. <laughs> Come on, fellas. <laughs> Hamish, welcome to the party. <laughs> Ron, welcome to the party. Are all the others hiding? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up, shut up, yes. And where will we be without Brian? <laughs> okay, end of our little bit of video. Thank you so much for joining in today, folks. Flossie is going to be mothballed again sometime quite soon. Uh, but we hope next year to take the project a bit further and carry on with this video. In the meantime, thanks for everybody turning up today. Whatever we produce here, you'll get a copy of. Take care, folks. Bye. but I, uh, I think it was last Wednesday, I, the phone rang in my office, familiar, familiar voice at the other end, Raymond Bird here, Roger. Good God. And uh, he said, when is your 1301 meeting? And I said, it's next Wednesday, uh, Dickie. Ah, he said, I thought it was. He said, give my apologies. He said, I'm going on holiday uh, tomorrow. And he was extremely bouncy, very sorry he couldn't be here. And all being well, he should be somewhere in the middle of the deserts of Western China, no doubt enjoying himself with two friends and a driver in a four-wheel drive. But he sends everybody his uh, very best wishes and is so sorry not to be with us and looks forward to talking to everybody on other occasions. But uh, he would otherwise uh, have come, and he was very keen to come, and he is certainly alive and well. Uh, so nice to hear, and thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that has been so outstanding when you meet Dr. Bird is the bright eyes and the bird-like intelligence that is still there. You saw him in 2004, which is now five years ago. Um, Any time he can actually make it to the project, we would love to see him, and the project, if it continues, celebrates its 50th year of the life of the machine in 2012. Uh, I know that's a year that has some other celebrations in it, um, but we would love any time that he believes he can make it to welcome Dr. Bird back to a different environment. It was very crowded in those days, so thank you so much, Roger. Uh, can both, as both Roger and I are here, can we answer any other questions? If not, I'll close by saying some thank yous. I'll just give a, a quick comment, actually. Um, I think you overpriced the machine. Because when they introduced the 1301, the economy version, one of the strap lines for sales was it was 50,000 pounds. 
Uh, for a basic machine. Very basic machine, yeah. yes. Uh, I guess so your figure's probably... Uh, the, the, the figure was the top end figure. Um, and I've never seen a machine that was configured the top end. Uh, we actually have a machine which now has three drums on it. It's quite powerful and most customers only have one. Um, the maximum lineup actually in working environments was possibly five decks. We now have eight. So if you actually took the highest possible cost deck, all of the drums, all of the peripherals, yes, it would come in perhaps not quite as high as 250, but including training, yes, so the kind of figures that were being made. It was very lucrative money when you consider the, uh, the time of life. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, fine. Hi. Yeah. I managed to recently read some tapes, that, including one I made in 1975. Your tapes are really a bit older than that. Are you managing to read them? Okay. Yes, with one caveat. Um, we believe that tapes are recoverable over quite a long period, provided, one, you do not start spooling them. I'm now convinced it's spooling from spool to spool that disturbs the, the remnant magnetism. But when you do start to access the tape, you will find the amplitude of the signal falls off very, very rapidly. This is one of the reasons why Roger and I currently work with work tapes, but we've now observed this phenomenon time and time again. We're reading these tapes quite successfully, but what we find is that the signal is, say, 100% when we start, and within three or four passes, the signal level is going down. Um, so to most people, including uh, somebody who I know is now trying or planning to recover the Atlas Supervisor tape, our advice would be, don't read that tape any more times than you need to. Make sure your mechanism is as perfect as possible. This is why I believe we have something like about 26 or 27 rooms, Roger, of tape to recover. Of, yeah. the, of the library, about three of them taken all. Precisely. Um, but we certainly won't be touching the, the important tapes until we're certain. It's, that seems to be a very rapid degradation once you disturb the tape. Uh, sorry, Dick. Sorry. sorry, Dick. Sorry, Dick. You mentioned that there was a cost reduced version, the third mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of that. Um, but that seems to have been a decision taken in the face of being unable to produce sufficient machines. It seems a very odd decision to there, take. There, there were actually two decisions made. The first one was to get systems out there to meet customers' demand and the demand for a lower price. I, I don't know quite what the profit margin was. There was a lot of money slopping around in the company in those days. That's basically it. We, we built Putney, we had uh, Hyde Park offices. There was a lot of money. Um, I don't know how much of it was a decision to try and produce a cheaper machine, faster, uh, to actually not lose those important customers. They were customers praying in cars and they just couldn't turn them out. The second move, of course, was to wheel in the RCA machine, the 1500, um, as a stopgap to the smaller customer. So if you sold the more expensive system to the bigger installation and you just literally did a, a job like Tandy around the back door for the people who just wanted the electronic tap, then I believe they actually have the different times. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really very really excited about you talk to people like Humpacks about, because they, they caught the tape. My, my son has audio tapes that uh, uh, have been caught and are quite playable again. They have to be specially treated. Uh, well, we, haven't, we haven't disturbed the tapes. That's the first thing we need to say to you. We don't want to disturb the material. Yeah. There were two philosophies for this whole uh, resurrection project. One was driven by David Holdsworth and he said to get the machine, take the deck, build a PC. Roger and I actually went through that but the, the actual cost of doing that would have been money that wasn't available at the time and still isn't. Um, we believe that by rebuilding the machine and capturing a binary image of these types, which we hope to, to do, certainly within the next year or certainly within the 50 year life of the machine, that we've captured the binary contents of the tape, and like most of our other projects, we now then need to spend years pulling that data back. But it's more important that we catch a good binary image first time because of that degradation problem. What we don't want to do is let those tapes go anywhere until we've tried it. We still have other options. We could still, if the machine fires, go for the deck recovery. We still have lots and lots of card packs. But you do not put aged card packs through 300 card mm -hmm. readers mm -hmm. because they just come out mush. In fact, one of the, the side projects which I'll mention is the fact that we've had to learn how to read punch cards with flatbed scanners because it's safe. 
Uh, that in turn produced a mechanism which is almost about ready to go, called a slow motion card reader. You literally chuck a card in it. PC analyzes what goes past and then spits a card image out as a file. So we're trying not to damage the medium that this information is on. We want the actual software to drive the emulators. As simple as that. <laughs> Anything else? Now, I was your dilemma. Clearly, you must capture the bits and store them on the on media. But if you want to show, restore the machine to the running state, you want it to be running on the tapes, don't you? Uh, you do, uh, but obviously, for obvious reasons, we are not touching those master tapes. Yeah, there, is there is a very good tape library. There is a very good tape library. The tapes you see going backwards and forwards have mm -hmm. been backwards and forwards so, time, so many times I've actually said to Roger, is there any oxide left? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any records from, from, from the old ICL records available on all customers? And, and the um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the archive is out of ICT, ICL, and then ICL from JIT, so it's gone in two directions. Um, Hamish actually grabbed quite a large quantity, but Hamish cannot find these kinds of records. Uh, we are aware that ICL slash Fujitsu has handed its archive over. Um, that is actually available, but it's been passed over in a form which is a bit naughty. It's on aperture cards, if you've ever met them. Uh, that's a punch card with a little window with a 35 millimeter slide in it. So you use a punch card to search the cards, and then the, the image is on there. Um, they passed over the library of images. They didn't pass over the index. But I happen to know of a group that is currently going through that library. They are currently hand scanning it. They are determined to get that information which has uh, lost its index. And it goes like this. The first one says this document referenced, and that document points you to another, to another, to another. But you don't know which order to scan the library in. There's a lot of people out there actively recovering this information, which the big companies don't want to know. They've thrown it in the bin. But the most important thing is they've passed it to people who do want to recover the information, which is an extension of the 39 Resurrection Project. So I'm chair question. Yes, yeah. There, there, there was in fact a customer in London sign of it, which was a which was a thirteen hundred. It was these five hundred uh, fifty thousand pound jeans. And I am pretty sure that they had cassettes to be uh, they could indeed have done because as you saw it was the end of their life. It almost was anything. Bin, it, it was yeah. Anything was possible. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very open design. Mm. It was a design of its time. It it was only Two bus stops in the timeline of computers, but uh, it was it's been bumped. <laughs> I noticed on your video of the Fosse you know, and the ICL look at that company. Mm. Um, I happen to know that that was quite an expensive little, shall we say, indulgence that the owner gave to himself. And okay. I, I, I thoroughly applaud it. The ICL logo is actually by Martha. All right. right. In Cumbria. Ah. I had a I spent a lot of money having some proper ICT from the scan of the original one. Good, good. Which was not to say. Uh, no more questions? Mention the machine has been modified quite a bit from time to time, particularly by Galdor. Can you reassure the group uh, that the original design is still very much intact? Uh, certainly, Fossey, as you know, has been modified. Uh, as regards Fossey is concerned, the original design can never really be because it's never been modified. Um, if we are looking at a completely unmodified machine, we have to put 12 up, really. Uh, but then again, with all the varieties of machines around, how far do you need to get totally authentic? Um, point taken? <laughs> I'm thinking of the way that uh, Galdor added instructions to uh, modify addresses. Precisely. Uh, put a switch so you could transform the sterling arithmetic into uh, pure binary and so on. Certainly no of the mod none of the modifications which Galilor fitted have been removed from Floss. Um, they have been retained. Even if from time to time we go, uh oh, uh, it doesn't look right. What does the mod book say? <laughs> they are still there. <laughs> okay, okay. Including the face like Luke on the job. Sorry. I'll just make it my name's Dennis Hughes. Hi. I'd just like to make a, a couple of observations. Um, the machine that showed first in the um, Cadbury's uh, machine, that was um, commissioned in New Zealand quite early. It was. And 
I was the engineer that commissioned it. Nice to meet you, sir. And um, Bruce McMillan uh, did his cleaning, and as I did originally, with a guy called Jack Nicholson. Now that means a bell. And I think that he trained a hell of a lot of engineers, so a lot of credit must go to Jack Nicholson. Uh, most certainly. And that training was done in um, Steve Mitch. In Dick. Uh, and uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you where Jack is now. And he may not be here. But um, um, Bruce McMillan was one of the best engineers I ever had. I understand the machine was going. And um, the only thing about it is that it is a basic machine. I can't, I, um, and, a no tape machine. A non-make tape machine, but still 1300, so it's so, so, so good to hear that. And it's strange that you should mention the instructor's name. Uh, we were very, very kindly in receipt recently from Alan uh, for a couple of manuals, uh, engineering manuals, which he passed over. Um, uh, er Ernie or? Yeah. Sorry, his name's not on the website. I've got access problems and updating the website. But I was only too happy to see on the front of that diagram, <coughs> sharing the same thought with you, a name that had been crossed through, and then a name that had been added, and a name that had been crossed through, and then a name that had been added as these diagrams were passed on. But if I went back to the original owner of the set of logic diagrams, I find another trainer's name of Neil Stewart. And that name is still on the front of that set of manuals, so it was wonderful to see Alan. Thank you so much. <laughs> If that's it, I would like to say some thank yous. So first of all, thank you for coming. But thanks must go to Dr. Burr for that original design and the design team, the work they did on a very, very open design that had a long life. I would like to publicly thank Gallo for rescuing number six, despite my advice not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly I'd like to thank Roger for keeping Flossie safe and the improvements that you've made. I do know the money that has vanished out of personal pockets to do that. And to any or everybody who sent anything into the project, visited the website, or given us a pat on the back for what we're doing, a big thank you. But most important thanks must go to the CCS for adopting us back in February of this year. Thank you so much. <laughs>